<laughs> Jeez. What is up, everybody? Welcome into Debate Night. We are back once again. We've got another episode. We're going to talk all about the Portland Open. Had some exciting things happen uh, this past weekend, some interesting topics to discuss. But let's get right into it. We are joined, as always, today, new webcam, Brody Smith. Yeah. Um, no, I did actually read the comments. I, we just started the show, and I said, actually, I didn't read the comments. I did read the comments. They did kind of throw me off a little bit. Man of the people, uh, <laughs> I guess we... We put COVID in the title. So I don't even know if that video even got Mm. monetized uh, because the the top comment said, thank goodness Google put the COVID disclaimer on this video. So I don't know what happened, uh, but there was some people saying that they want the rebuttals. They don't want me interrupting. So I will not be interrupting, but the rebuttals will be coming back if someone says something crazy. Okay. Yeah. It put a, we put like the title was like, did the COVID disc golf bubble burst or something like that? And it, and Google automatically inserts like the CDC recommends blah, 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 like above the comments. It was real funny. Um, anyways, yeah. I don't know what that did to monetization. Gary is here once again. No bricks. No bricks tonight. I'm at home. My one year old manager is asleep in his playpen next to me, but uh, coming off of a fresh, hot tournament win this weekend, I'm feeling Ooh. good, Ooh. feeling great, ready to throw down on some debate night stuff. What division? No I'm, a dirty, I'm, I'm a dirty interme- intermediate player. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Respect that. Respect that. Um, we're also joined today by Sam. Sam is back. Thank you for having me back. I hope to, uh, I don't know, maybe antagonize a little bit today, throw some crazy Excellent. things. I, I hope to be the person that Brody argues with the most. That's, uh, that's always my goal. Okay. We love a villain around here. Um, and then Dustin is here as well, rounding out the group today. Indeed, I am. I haven't gotten beaten by Gary enough yet this year, so I figured I'd show up again and, uh, you know, just see what happens, you know? That's right. Hey, Gary, how many Gary? How many goat votes did you get? Uh, I saw one comment on it, but, you know... Only one? Who was getting the most of the votes? I didn't get a chance to look at it. I, I think I got one. I think I think Brody got two or three for sure. Um, you know, was this for? <laughs> last I mean, week, we asked people no to comment who the goat my was from last year. I, that I, I is shambolic. That's, that's uh, yeah. the that's uh, the new age, Dustin. They just yeah, they just don't know, man. Us I'm old heads, the, we know. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyways, all right, we're gonna hop right into this. We've got some exciting stuff to talk about. First topic: Paige Pierce. Paige Pierce is back, or is she? What are your immediate reactions to her dominant win in Portland? Too soon to tell, or are you back on the bandwagon? What are we thinking about Paige Pierce? Brody, let's go. Uh, Well, first thing is, I think me and you have very different definitions of dominant. I would not consider this a dominant win by any means. If you look on the MPO side, Dan and Burr, that was a dominant win. Uh, Paige Pierce wasn't winning, wasn't leading the field until after the third round. So um, she came back. Now, with that being said, this is something that I think is what all of us secretly, if you didn't go out and say, hey, I, I want Paige Pierce to, to do well, this is what all of us kind of want. We want Paige to get that taste of winning again, get that confidence back, and just to add an extra element, an extra player to the mix. Because we're seeing people like Colin Hanley who – had a very, very good final round, shooting 11 under, finishing in second place. She is like right on the precipice of finally, uh, you know, breaking through and, and getting, you know, not just one win, but racking up multiple ones. We've seen Ella Hansen do that this year. We're seeing more and more players step up. Own Scoggins is a player that's in the mix. Then obviously the Europeans who were not at this event. And I know there's probably going to be a lot of people that ding Paige's win because Kristen wasn't there, Evelina, you know, The list goes on, but you still have to beat the people that are in the field. And she did do that. And we've seen some of the people in the field go toe to toe against these Europeans. And uh, I I cannot see the clock, which I just ran out of time. That clock is so small. Silas, man, another complaint versus the clock. No, 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 that's on me. That's on me. I need need to make (laughs) there. I need to make that big. Okay. All right. There you go. There you go. All right, Gary, what do you think about Paige Pierce? Yeah, when looking at the MPO outcome, it's really hard to describe this as dominant. Uh, Brody's right on that one. After the first round, I was like, okay, here we go. Another top 10 finish. After the second round, 
I got excited. And after round three, it kind of felt like disc golf from two or three years ago. Looking at the stats, though, it's really easy to see why she did so well. There were only three players that were uh, C1 in regulation over 40%. Paige led that list. Only two players in C2 in regulation over 70%. And Paige was in there. We all know, you know, Glenn Devere requires like a, a matchup of distance and accuracy. And, and Paige kept putting herself on the dance floor. And with 86% C1X putting, she took advantage of all the opportunities that she gave herself. It's, it's a really big win. And we all know, and I think we can all agree disc golf is better when Paige is competitive. Um, and some people are going to say, like Brody said, that the Europeans weren't there. And I, I don't think you can argue that, that she didn't put down four great rounds. And she held off an incredibly surging Holland despite rainy conditions. I think we need to be a little bit careful, though, because, you know, everyone's talking about how they cried afterwards. Paige's journey. I keep hearing 326 days since she posted about her leg. We need to see more before we just claim definitively that she's back. She's saying she feels better physically, that she has more confidence in her leg and her mechanics. But Paige's mental game has always been a big concern to me. I feel like she only really experiences peaks and valleys in her own mind. And uh, she needs to stop putting like her career on her shoulders and just focus on each event as they happen. And she's going to be crushed under the weight of her own expectations if she's not careful. So I hope this is it. I hope she can run the roost while Kristen's gone. And seeing them come back together for a dynamite battle is going to be amazing if that happens. Yeah, certainly, certainly hoping that that's the case um, once Kristen um, is able to recover and get back on the tour. Uh, Sam, what were your thoughts on Paige's performance? Are you saying she's back? Listen, uh, Paige Pierce, in my mind, is undisputedly the greatest female FPO player to ever do it. She she is the GOAT of that division. Um, but as far as calling it, uh, are we back on the bandwagon? I don't know that we can really have a bandwagon following for somebody who's averaging an 18th place finish for the season. Yeah. Yes. She's coming back off of injury. Yes. It's going to be struggled. This she said in an interview, this is the first time she's felt super confident pushing off with her leg and re really ripping into the disc. And I, I love that she's getting that confidence back. I'm not sure yet that we can call it quite a bandwagon following, but I am 100% on team Paige Pierce. You know, I've got I've got my passion in one hand and I've got my drive in the other, um, and I'm I'm ready to see Paige succeed. Uh, she mentioned in an interview I was listening to earlier today that in the past couple of years she's kind of been ashamed of her drive to want to win, and has kind of been backtracking on what her personality was in disc golf for a long time, and that was that I'm going to go get it. It's it's me. I'm the person who's going to win this week. Um, and she's kind of back in that mental state is what she's saying. And if that's true, I, I'm afraid for the rest of the field. I, I can't wait to watch her and Kristen battle. Um, I'm still not sure about the bandwagon, but again, I'm 100% team Kristen. Yeah, definitely has had a few interesting mental shifts as far as like, it seemed like for a while there, she was kind of trying to downplay everything being like the winning isn't everything, but now it's kind of like it's it's been a tricky thing to navigate. Um, Dustin, what's your perception of the of the Paige Pierce return? Well, I mean, she's certainly trending in the right direction, right? I mean, she had a top five finish at the OTB Open prior, and then she just won the Portland Open. And yeah, we're talking about how Tatar and Solomon weren't there, but she did beat people who have won on tour this season, like Own, like Holland, like Missy, like Ella Hansen, like Anik and Sten. Like these players were there, and she beat them, and she did so with really good just eye test in my opinion is the biggest thing um her c1x putting has been great throughout most of the events this season but it seemed like at the other tournaments this year she would have like one round where she was kind of off on the putting green she had like one round where her c1x putting wasn't quite there that didn't happen this event her c1x putting was fantastic all four rounds that she played uh eye test wise you can see that she seems to be there physically and mentally physically her backhand power is back she's throwing the distance that you would expect her to be able to throw from her heyday um so her physical rehab and reps seem to be doing good but i think it's also about the trust like being able to trust your plant foot is so huge and i think that the fact that she has that confidence that she is able to go and throw the way that she wants to throw is huge and one of her quotes was is that right now when she steps to the tee pad she knows where her disc is going to go and she knows that she can deliver the disc the way that she wants to and i think that that is really the bigger thing than just the win itself is the confidence in the mental game that hey i can win hey i am past this injury i am where i need to be um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think it's too soon to call. She's going to be, you know, up there with the grades of FPO this year, but I think she probably will be a consistent top 10 player from here on out. And she's going to have chances to get more wins as the season progresses, especially if you can get her circle two putting back in action. I think that that's really the one thing that she still could work on a bit.
Yeah, I, I think that, you know, injuries can be super tricky with the um, the whole idea of trust. And, and and I've seen so many disc golfers develop weird hitches in their form due to the lack of trust in injury. Because once you don't trust it and you're still trying to play and practice on it, you're going to hammer in bad habits and things that, are, that can be really tough to work out. You start to forget what it was like to play the other way. Um, I, I definitely feel like... Um, it's going to be interesting to, to watch as things go on. You know, is this something that clicked and it's, and it just happened to happen for this event and that was that, or is it going to continue? Certainly would be great for FPO disc golf to have more top competitors. Slight rebuttal. Uh, Dustin, you mentioned Holland Hanley. Holland Hanley actually hasn't won for this year and actually has never or She only won throw pink last year. And that, was <laughs> or, that was kind of, con- well, that was last year. You said this year, right? I'm and sorry. That was pretty controversial of a win. If you want oh, to go Lord. down that right. But um, teammate, bro. this year, though, I will say that there is no teams in disc golf. Um, <laughs> the 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 thing that I think is really fascinating and something that uh, I'm not actually we're gonna get into that in a second. Okay, I'll hold off. Okay, um, I will say though, uh, and you meant I think oh, Dustin, maybe I won't get into that actually. Go on. That's, never mind. No, it's fine. We'll see what happens. I think it was Dustin mentioned the eye test, and I think that was the biggest thing with uh, Paige, just like watching her throw backhands. It, it felt like the old page, the way she was hitting lines, just throwing some really, really great, some great lines, Heiser flips. It, it looked, it, it brought me all the way back you know to what like, was interesting? I, don't, I don't know if y'all noticed this as well. It, it only happened a couple of times here in the tournament, but it was also during a practice round. She filmed with Holland. She's starting to develop beforehand. Like, and I'm curious to see how that develops going forward because it actually didn't look that bad. That's why these people that say that she's gotten worse. I don't really quite understand that her putting, her putting is just as good as it's ever been. Like Dustin was just said, she actually has a forehand now. She never used to throw a forehand back when she was winning all the time. This idea that she's gotten worse, I I think it's just more of a mental thing for her. I think she ha- her physical skills, obviously she got injured, yeah. and you can do whatever you want with that. But I'm talking about even prior to injury, people are like, oh, Paige is, is like not playing as well as she used to. Yeah, it's like, it was all in her head. I was like, yeah. I yeah, yeah, I think a lot of it was more just the pre- – like we don't ever say that like when – when we see a player crumble towards the end, we don't really ever say like, oh, that player just played really like that player had a bad tournament. It's like, no, the pressure got to them. And I think with Paige, what was going on is that pressure was there from hole one, where a lot of players get that pressure late in the tournament when it's like, oh, wow, I could win. Paige was feeling that pressure from hole one because yeah. her whole MO was I'm the best. No one can beat me. And then all of a sudden, when she started getting smacked around, that that was a yeah. very like I just don't think she was able to step up to the plate like a lot of other people have. Yeah, and, I think uh, the other big thing that you got to think is where about be is interesting to see what happens. Yeah, I think the other big thing for her is like you know that whole documentary and the pressure that that probably put on her. Yeah. The fact that she was going to be the first to get six world titles in the FPO division, and yeah. she didn't do it because of that love shot. A lot of spotlight. <laughs> it's, like, yeah. it, it's a lot, man. It's a lot. I, but. I, I, I never would have. I never would have said that Paige Pierce had just lost her ability to play golf. It, it was always mental, and that. Mm-hmm. That's why for the longest time I was just watching Kristen dominate and just trying to remember like Paige how she was and be like. Like I feel like that page would be very competitive, and and I think that is the case. So I'm, I hope it continues. Um, La- last thing on page, real quick, because I do find this actually be like one of the more fascinating stories in FPO, mm-hmm. is like the way you see like Gannon play the final mm-hmm. round of where he didn't really. I mean, obviously he still had pressure on him to win in that position that he had, mm-hmm. uh, but he just didn't really perform up to the level that he needed to, like what he had prior but he's still one handily. I feel like that's kind of what Paige was back in the day is she yeah. knew that she could go out there and just putts around, throw shots, run putts from 80 feet and still win. Even if she's not playing well. Yeah. And now that pressure is so much higher because there are, I mean, heck this Sophia girl that came out of nowhere. There's yeah. people that are just coming out of the woodworks down FPO because the field is or used to be so thin. It's a weird uh, adjustment. It's a lot. It's a, yeah, it's a huge adjustment. Anytime mm. you have to adjust from being able to play okay golf and be in contention to now you have to play good golf. Like that's, yeah, that's a very yeah. weird thing to adjust to. Um, well, we're going to talk about something else that happened during pages round. That was a bit interesting. Um, we saw an interesting mandatory call happen on hole 12 of the final round for the FPO lead card. Paige Pierce split a forked tree and went right of the Mando left sign. So we had an M pointing to the left, um, but ultimately was informed the Mando sign 
was just signaling the entire tree, and the rightmost part of the tree was the actual line. This meant that she made the Mando. So I want to know, do you think this was just a miscommunication between the card that led to the delay and the rules discussion that followed, or do Mandos need to be communicated or decided differently? What's your takeaway from this situation and all the mishap that, that was kind of surrounding it, Gary? I think there's two really important things to think about here. Number one is the perspective from like the card. It was nice to see all four card members getting involved and discussing this very fairly. And they brought in a marshal like they should have. And Paige very clearly articulated what she thought had happened. And if you timed it, the entire engagement only lasted about two minutes. Um, so Paige made a good call. I think on the provisional would be safe because she didn't want to repeat of the opinions of 2019 worlds, but she hit the big shot, which made it a three anyways, which is the best possible outcome. But let's talk about the perspective on the event side, which is, Ian and Zoe didn't know whether it was made or not. Uh, why doesn't the commentary team have the caddy guide available to them? But even if they would have had the caddy guide, the wording that was used in that caddy guide was kind of more confusing than the PDGA rule itself. Under hole 12, the wording wasn't very, very clear. You know, at my local events, it would have said something like the rightmost part of the tree defines the mandatory line. And they even had a graphic in the players in the player's guide that showed a line connecting to the sign, not the tree. Very confusing. Um, but and also they said the scorekeeper marked it as a Miss Mando before they even walked up to the tree. And you can't be doing that stuff. The marshal seemed flustered. He was saying things like up from the bottom of this and the signs a navigational indicator like it just didn't seem like he was most prepared. But they should have placed the sign on the far right of the tree. They should have improved the caddy guide language. I think the only positive thing from this moment that I can talk about other than how the card itself handled it is that the DGN did at least build some good tension by cutting over to Holland, hitting the birdie putt on 13 to show the pressure of the moment. Despite some confusion, I think that only lasts about two minutes to the average viewer. This wasn't that big of a deal. Okay. Yeah, I, I definitely can agree that it seemed like things got moving once, um, you know, I feel like Paige handled it well. Um, Sam, what was your takeaway from the Mando um, debacle? Yeah, I think I think it's a pretty simple issue to explain, and that is it's a failure on the part of the tournament director. Um, language at a caddy book, I wasn't able to read it for myself. I couldn't find it online, um, but it, uh, it evidently wasn't clear. I mean, the caddy book should be clear. The marking on the tree should be clear. It and there really shouldn't be any sort of question in course layout headed in to an elite plus tournament. Like that, that is absurd in my mind that a tournament director let, let something, I know it's minor. It, it, it's a one in a million shot that happened that makes this a question to begin with, but it's still a, a hole in the planning for this tournament. And, and I think that that's what needs to be addressed at, at the key part of it. Um, the, the sign needs to be moved. The caddy book needs to be updated. Other than that, you know, I think the card handled it very well. They had good discussion. Owen made a great point. It's like, hey, this isn't how we normally played it. The sign's here. She missed the sign. I get that. It, luckily, they did have somebody official with them. I thought that, that that was something that I took away from it, was that they had somebody there who could make the official call which I thought was important. Normally we don't have that, you know, it's not like the a golf scenario where you have to call in a marshal. There was somebody there who saw it, who was able to make the call. He wasn't very confident in his call, um, but he made it nonetheless. And I thought that that was a good plus. Yeah. It was funny watching the marshal, um, like, making the call like correctly as to how it was supposed to, but like seeming unsure the whole time. Like it's almost, he didn't want to break the news, even though it was technically good news. Um, Dustin, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I mean, first things first is Paige did the right thing by playing a provisional. And also, thankfully, she hit an insane throw in. So she got par from both lives. So it wound up being a non factor in this individual case. So no matter what you think about it, there's no controversy here because she hit that throw in, which is like incredibly lucky. Of course, you don't want it to come down to that. But at the end of the day, I felt like everything got handled the way that it was supposed to outside of A, how the tree got it marked, because obviously the Mando sign should have been on the furthest right of the tree, not to the left of the fork to cause that confusion. And then as Gary had already indicated, like the language in the caddy book is not clear and, and that shouldn't be a big deal. Like you should be able to go into the caddy book and say that the Mando means left of the entire tree, not just of the fork in the tree. Uh, you know, it, it's of the furthest right or whatever the case may be. So, you know, those things should have been clear from signage perspective and from a caddy book perspective. Um, again, it was good. There was a marshal involved in this situation and, and a provisional was played. So everyone did what they were supposed to do. I don't think, that the delay was that big of a deal i can understand why there was confusion based on the signage and based on the caddy book but it seems like they arrived to the right conclusion thanks to the you know marshall's help and thanks to the discussion that took place uh, again i just think that in the future 
you know, you need to make sure that if you have a mandatory, that there is a way to play through the object and not just simply go around it or something like that. You have to be very explicit in what you mean by what is the mandatory and what isn't. And unfortunately, in this case, that, that didn't happen between the signage and the, and, the, and the caddy book. So that's all that really needs to be done going forward is that things need to be written in better language and things can be marked better. It almost seems like whoever wrote the caddy book was not actually there and just knew there was a tree <laughs> like yeah. that's the vibe I got from it. Um, Brody, you're a big Mando guy. What do you, what do you think about this mandatory? I, I think all three of you guys, I mean, sure. You guys all said cool stuff, but I think you're all missing <laughs> the big, you're missing the big point here. I don't think it, it matters how they discussed it. I don't think it matters that there's a marshal there. I think the big issue here is the PDGA needs to stop doing crap. Go figure out the rule system that can be, across the board you guys each one of you said oh you could just look in the caddy book you that should not happen on a on a simple thing like this and on a lot of holes you shouldn't have to look in the caddy book to say how are we playing this hole because one guess who doesn't have a caddy book fans spectators so if you're telling me like this hole plays differently than hole seven and then the hole 13 is going to play different. But if you had the caddy book, you would, this whole notion of us having to look to see like, how does this hole play? How does it, that's ridiculous. We need to have a standard thing of this is how the rules are set. And every hole is just followed by these rules. And so to me, like the Mando, the fact that it's even on a tree, that's got a fork like that. And we're like, there goes the blues. <laughs> um, <laughs> That it's even on the fork like that. And we're trying to figure out like, how do we play this? Cause I'm the same way with own. Like it went right of where the sign is that you missed the Mando. Like that's how the rules should be. And the fact that it, it changes and, and it can change depending on who's on your card. Cause maybe that person can persuade the other people. I, we just need to have a set rule that makes sense from hole to hole and we don't have to change it. And it's, it's not on the TD, by the way. Whoever said it was on the TD, that's ridiculous. <laughs> oh, uh, an interesting point there, Brody, is just a, a clarification. I'm not saying that players should ever get to the tee pad and go, let's look at the caddy guy and see how the hole's played. I think as professionals, you have a burden to understand what the course is playing like and what rules are established on the course. I like the idea that they at least drew a line on the ground to create that like designated space, and they should have understood that before the event. But in moments where you have to have a, 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 a rule clarification, you have to be able to go to something concrete that's written that establishes this is how the rule is going to be played for everybody. So I think you have to have a caddy guide that makes sense for moments where things that happen that may but be see, unclear for different. But see, groups. you're you're saying the wrong thing. You're saying caddy guide. By saying caddy guide, you're saying that that's force dependent. What I'm saying is you need to have a rule book. And the rule book never have a caddy guide. Rule, correct. Why, why do you need to have a caddy guide? You, do you, do you need to have a different rule book every time you play the, Monopoly, Dustin? Or do you just need yeah, one but, rule book? But Monopoly board like, stays the same you every time you the play. Same. Yeah, it's, exactly. it's a different board. Disc, board. Golf, disc golf should, that's the whole point. Disc golf should be the same. We should be going to course and course and saying, well, this course we're going to play with by these rules. This course mm -hmm. we're going to these rules. It's not that about the no rule. It's about how something was marked physically. It's not about yeah. the rule itself in this situation. Yeah, the rule all should be marked the same. Dustin is what I'm saying. Oh, true. it should have, be the same. So who's responsible have, for putting the sign should, on the tree? Dustin, then we should have some courses where there's a white stake for the OB and a painted line in front for OB and a painted line behind. The rule yeah. book should be standard. That's what I'm saying. There should be a yeah. standard. We we should we, all know if you we, go left of a Mando sign, if a Mando sign's pointing this way and you miss it. Yes. You missed the sign. Yes. You missed the Mando. There is no Who's question. Who's responsible of, for placing that sign on the tree? It's the tournament director, which not the PDGA. Which was my whole which was my argument, Brody. And I don't understand what you mean by how is that not the tournament director's fault? He's he is the reason for the miscommunication. Yeah, yes, the rule the rule should be standardized. I 100 percent agree. Yeah, agree with you. Yeah, we all agree on with you but, on that but one. Mm -hmm. th that's not that's not the question. So you're saying, the rule was standardized in this case. If the sign is placed the, incorrectly, the sign you was still put can't on the wrong. Right. You're saying the sign was put on the wrong side of the tree. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Now here's my th here's my thing. Again, standardized rules. Standardized rules. It should go off of what you're playing. If I'm imagine imagine this. Imagine this. Imagine throwing a shot and getting up there, and someone misplaced where the OB was supposed to be, and in the caddy book, it's not there. 
And I go, oh, look at, I mean, I think this was MVP with Paul Macbeth back at a uh, whole eight or whatever this kind of happened of where the caddy book said, let's say the caddy book said it wasn't OB, but on the actual, you know, course it was OB. I think, again, this should be something that should be standardized rule that you play based off of what is in front of you. Yeah. Not what's we, in a caddy book. If we you agree look, with that. We agree with that. Okay, and so she should have missed the Mando. But at the Mando. end of the day, the TD has to execute that properly. But I'm saying she should have missed the Mando is what I'm trying to say. If you if we're playing by the rule that if you go the, if you miss if you miss the sign, you have to play by the sign, not by what the the even if the sign was played. placed improperly. But it, is the sign is said, that even you have to go you have to go no. off of what the people are saying. What, what well, is, that's what that's the, the question though. The sign was saying one thing, and everybody else was saying something else. So what so, do you go with in that instance? And so what I'm saying is if there is an OB, let's say there's an OB uh, roped sand trap, and in the caddy book, that sand trap is not OB, but someone by accident or whatever, let's just put OB there, you have to say that that's OB now. We can't go off of, you can't go off of what the cat, and that's what I'm saying. There's a standardized rule that basically what the course is playing, Yeah, because you can't assume everyone's going to play it the same way. I could people go out and like standardized rule. Okay. I could go out at night and I could remark lines, and now you have to say they're OB because I remarked the lines. I'm if saying the, you have. If, what, what I'm saying is you have to go one way or the other. You can't have people say I'm going to go off of what is playing on the field, and I'm going to go off the caddy book. That's all I'm trying to yeah, say. They should standardize match. it across. Ideally, it should match, but if it yeah. doesn't match, there should be a standard rule for what you go off of. Is what I'm uh, trying to say. Agreed, but the, at the end of the day, the tournament director's job is to make sure that they keep up with the standardized rule created by the PDGA if we're going to do it that way. If they don't, the the question's not like, what should the rule be? The question is, wh why was there a confusion? The confusion was because it was communicated poorly. If you actually look at the caddy guide for the event, they do a big write-up on what, how mandatories are determined, and it doesn't even like match what the PDGA says. It's so confusing what they wrote in there for mandatory. Yeah, we're agreeing, Gary. We're yeah. agreeing, yeah. The, mandatory the, are very – We should have a caddy book. We should have a caddy book. Like as far as standardized rules, like – you mentioned OB, and that's a that's a perfect example of what should be just like we mark water with this stakes. We use the same we we use the same thing to mark OB. Like yeah. that makes it. Mandos are a weird one because like the essence of a mando is we're gonna throw a, like in, in my to my knowledge what it means is we're gonna throw a mandatory sign on a bigger object that already exists on the course. Typically, usually they're not man made, and we're going to then that sign basically assumes the object. But like they're never perfect because if you have even if you have a tree with a mando left sign and you throw it up above that tree, it's yeah. really hard to tell. So that, that mandos are just you a tricky to, one. You know how to you know how to standardize that rule? All triple mandos. No, <laughs> you can literally just you can literally just standardize the rule by literally saying if it if you miss the sign, the sign the sign is what's making a vertical line. Yeah, if but the go, sign is really yeah, hard to if, tell. What if, yeah, what if you're on a branch that sticks out like this and the sign's halfway up and then you go? But we are, but again, we're, we're saying all these things. These are already existing in disc golf. Oh. It's really hard to tell whether we crossed in bounds or we didn't. Players so when you're. Players are going to have to make that call. True. Remember, you know what's also really hard to tell is when you have a mando that's a tree. Like you, you literally just were saying the same exact thing that goes up into leaves. It's really hard to tell whether or not that yeah. crossed or not. Triple so mandos what, only, it's, baby. It's gonna be really hard to tell no matter what. But at least if we just standardize standardize it by saying, "Here's the sign," and you can even have a little line or something, whatever on the sign. I don't know what you want to do. Yeah. But just make it to where it's it's it, across the board. Everyone understands yeah. what's going. Well, on. my thing with and my thing with the forked tree situation too is, in my mind, you should never be playing off the right side of the tree. The mando should be the leftmost part of the tree. Yeah. Because then you just I then agree. you take that whole thing out of the equation. Yeah. You, you can't throw through the tree. Every time I've ever seen a forked tree with a mando, it's always the most innered inward yeah. part of it the should have like, said double mando and that would have solved the problem you have to go <laughs> yeah, through put, the tree. there you just go put both of them. yeah <laughs> i don't know it's a whole mess comment down below anything about mandos because they're a great mechanism but they they can be weird it's just um, it's just not a, it's not a fun look either watching players like throw a shot and then walk over to the t sign and be like okay can i go to the drop zone should i not go to the drop zone it, it is the, it has got i agree it has gotten out of hand with the fact that every different. single mm -hmm. hole needs this like long description Correct. and you're like you're getting up to the teapad like reading yeah. that that is it has gotten out of hand it used to be more mm -hmm. of a helpful tool now it's like this almanac that every player needs to look at before every hole we got and, lucky though we got lucky because it created a really really interesting uh hey, yeah, throw in night, though? Come on, and man. It, it created it. 
and it also created a drama when Holland yeah. hit that putt. So it's like it created drama. So for the average fan, it, they, they don't care. But this for us, look out. it was funny. I think Paige handled it well, and it was very funny to watch her be like paranoid because yeah. she knew about the last Mando scandal. She was not having <laughs> oh, another yeah. one. Right. Right. I respect that's, that. Respect that 100%. Because I would have been happened, there. That's happened twice again, too, because there was another time where Holland literally was like, no, I didn't cross this year. I don't know which yeah. one that was. <laughs> But she was, like very ones, ad- man. she was very adamant of like, oh, it was an OTB on the whole 10. She was like, yeah, I didn't cross. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. We're going to move on. We're going to talk a little about another um, another disc golf rule here. So the MPO field took the top 45 plus ties for the cut at this event after three rounds. Though 46 players made the cut, only 45 would cash, obviously, because you have the ties. This could be enhanced even more. So I want to know. Um, you know, people were kind of split on this. I want to know, should the cut line be a mechanism to completely rid the field of players that could no longer cash? Should that be the way we're looking at it? And if so, how do they fix the problem of ties? Should they adjust the person some way or the payout? Sam, what do you think? Can I ask a question really quick about this? Because yes, uh, just for clarity for everybody. Yeah. So yeah. in this question, you said 46 players made the cut, but only 45 players would cash. Right. Is there not tie situations where you split money at that point? So they did not. In, I don't believe they. I don't believe they split. Forty six didn't tie. So forty six. Right. Forty six was, wasn't forty six. Had they tied, they would have been tied for forty fifth and split money. Right. Well, I think that there was a tie at forty fifth. There was. If I'm not mistaken. I'm saying there's a scenario though where one yes, person yes, cannot yes. cash. Yeah, correct. Yeah, sure. Correct. Okay. Um. Yeah. Uh. All right, Sam. Go for it. I am all for the cash line and the cut line being two separate things. Um, And and that might be a little bit of an unpopular opinion, and I'm sure it's going to be an unpopular opinion with a lot of pros who it affects. But I think for disc golf as a, as a live sport, I think it increases watchability and adds more storylines. We talk all the time about how disc golf needs more storylines. It needs more things for the commentators to be talking about rather than just saying, oh, that was a good shot. Oh, that was a good putt. You know, they need they need stories to be telling throughout the coverage. And, and a cash line and a cut line have, have two different definitions. You know, a cut line is there so that the field is reduced, speed of play can be increased, and, and more resources can go to the players who are playing the best that weekend, right? That is the goal of a cut. And, and, I don't, those players don't necessarily deserve cash, but typically that is what happens. That's what happens on the PGA tour. But I think disc golf can be different in this way. I think it. I think it'd be such an interesting storyline to not only just have you know a tie for forty fifth and then have three players potentially missing cash if they play bad on Sunday, but think about having having 50% of the field make a cut going into Sunday and then only 40% are going to cash. And there's a three stroke difference between last cash and the cut line. And then you have players who are battling lights out just to try to make 150 bucks for the weekend. I think that that'd be super exciting golf to watch. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's definitely a, a one way to look at it is creating a, another narrative there on the final day. Um, Dustin, what do you think about the cash and cut line? So for me, I'll actually take a little bit of an opposite approach here. I think that the cash line, the cut line should be the exact same thing. So if you made the cut, you have secured last cash. And I think this is the cleanest way to do it because it's based on the percentage of the field and not some set number, which may not work depending on the field size. Now, so in this case, you had 112 players that are in the field and they cut it to the top 45. You could cut it to the top 45 plus ties, AKA those are the people who are going to cash because the cash line was 45 after the three rounds. So at that point, the final round is now about taking the players who are out of the cash, out of the equation to help with pace of play to, you know, not have less people on the you know course, all that, good, all that jazz. And then have the people who are actually competing for higher money still be able to compete to see if you can get the most cash basically, or, or propel themselves up the cash line, so to speak, if that's what you want to call it. Uh, I don't see that big of a concern with ties we have rules in place for how cash is split for tie situations they work fine so i think you know that shouldn't be too big of a deal and i just don't see a problem using the cash line plus ties at the cut line it seems to be the most uniform way to do it the only way that you could do it if you didn't do the cash line is by doing let's say a harsher cut like you're doing the top 30 percent or top 25 percent of the field um or you're doing a bigger cut where you're letting half the field play or something like that and then the cash line is still the 40 percent or whatever but i just think that that creates some inconsistency so i think just for percentage of players that you have i think that's the way to go about it. just cash line cut line same thing okay sticking sticking with the usual um brody what are your thoughts on this what do you think they should do with the cut line and cash i'm actually going to agree with sam here oh um, yeah, but That's I'm going to push it a little bit further, Sam. You t- you, you're talking about storylines, right? You're saying we need storylines. 
We need to talk about the guys that are in 46th, 47th place on Sunday. That's really interesting. I'm going to take it one step further. Let's make a cut after every hole, Sam. How exciting would that be? You play a hole, boom, one person's gone. You play the next hole, boom, one person's gone. Every hole. Let's not wait for one cut. Let's not wait for two cuts like you're saying, Sam. You know, cut after two rounds, cut after the final round as well with the cash line. Let's make a cut after every hole. That's what will get the people excited and watching. That'd be every fun. hole, baby. More cuts. But no, I mean, that's the whole thing is when you start stretching this out, it goes back to the kind of whole argument of like, oh, why don't we just have one hole be the entire course? Instead of 18 holes, let's just play one long hole and make that the entire course. There's a reason why there's just one cut. It's just clean and nice and easy. You go two cuts, why not go three? You go three cuts, why not go four? Let's just have it one cut. You make the cut, you make money. Simple as that. Easy peasy moving forward. No one's really going to care about who's cashing or not at the very end of the event. Anyways, they're going to be caring about who's winning. The cut line adds for a lot of information or a lot of drama when people aren't looking at who's going to win the event. Okay. Okay. That was a roller coaster. My goodness. Um, Gary, round it out for us. What do you think they should do? You know, personally, I feel a bit disconnected to this because I don't really think about the cat cash li- the the cash cut line very much. Uh, I only look at it when it comes to like streaks ending or if I've got like a PA local playing in the event. Um, I'd love to know how many viewers care about it. Get in the comments, let us know if you care about the the cash the cut line. But you know, maybe the DGN could take an extra minute or two to talk about it on coverage on Saturday. Like no, you know, notable players that are going to miss the cut or players in the bubble today. Um, I think that keeping the cut and cash line together makes a lot of sense. And I'm sorry to once again reference golf, but the PGA does the same same thing at 65 players um so and what they do for ties um they actually handle it by throwing out money to someone who finishes below like above the cut line but finishes outside 65th they they throw money to that i'm not saying the tour has money to do that kind of stuff and how often does it actually even happen like are you know are we talking about legitimate money in any way shape or form anyhow because the last cash at portland was only 444 dollars before the tie when it got split um, would it have been a big deal to kick $400 to Ren and Lotta? Probably not um, it, if, if he were to finish below. But um, I think the rules are fine the way they are now. If you're a player and you have a problem getting $222 as opposed to $444, just play better and don't be putting yourself in that position. Um, this only really feels like an issue because Portland is, is a super tight course, you know, aside from Gannon. And the event probably has a history of being the tightest event probably on tour with two previous events decided by a stroke and two events decided by a playoff. I say you keep the rules. Let's focus on stuff that matters a whole lot more. There's other things to focus on right now. So Gary cannot be a, bothered. This is not a rebuttal to Gary. I, I have this a, is a, a rebuttal for Brody. Is, okay. Um, well, <laughs> so let me do this one real quick. One, I yeah, think whoa, 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 whoa. Let Dustin go first. Let Dustin oh, yeah. go first. I was the first. One. So okay, Gary sorry, I can't point. hear Dustin. I don't Gary think. I think Dustin's audio is cut off. I can't hear Sam. Wow. Was Sam talking? Oh, Sam had to rejoin. Maybe maybe we lost Sam on comms. All good. Dang. Well, I can hear you, Sam. Go ahead. All right. We'll cut that. Anyway, so point is. Go ahead. Can Brody hear me? Oh, no. Sorry, Dustin. Okay. Right, Doug. I'm juggling. I'm juggling. Dustin, I'm sorry, go it's ahead. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. So Gary made a point that like not really caring about the cash line or cut line. And I think the reason for it is because it doesn't happen enough. Like it's not a, a, a it's not more of a you know, spot in our sport as it should be. And if it was, then I think people would start caring about it a lot more. Um, so that that's not really a rebuttal. That's just like kind of like a. I think that could make the game better. You know, if there was a more regular thing that people had to worry about, it would be more of a storyline. It would be more interesting. Or, or even like I said, like a one or two minute spot of like, hey, here are the players on the bubble. You know, one of my favorite things to do after a tournament, and this is just, I guess, the masochist in me is I like to go look and see what notable players didn't like just tanked it that week yeah. i find it i find it interesting and seeing players finish outside the cut line especially yeah. at a local here who finished in 65th place and beat a lot of notable pros it's kind of fun to, it's fun to look at but during the actual event yep. i don't tend to pay attention to it very much i definitely do as well um brody i can't hear sam so if sam's gonna say yeah, something too can, can um, anybody um, else hear me? i was just gonna say i, I can, can hear, hear sam oh um, yeah Okay, I guess someone needs Dang. to relay if he starts talking to me. We'll translate I, for you, Sam. We'll translate, <laughs> yeah. Um, t- the couple things that I was going to say is I agree Dust- with Dustin. I think if we do three three round events, there needs to be a cut after the second round. Four round events, there needs to be a cut around after the second round as well for a four round event. I think that makes it a lot more, uh, like you were saying, um, Gary, to get you more involved instead of you paying attention to that after the event, you'd be paying too much attention to 
who's not going to be playing this weekend? Holy cow, like Paul McBest on the cut line. Is he going to be playing this weekend? That's exciting. The Quick question. That- Do you do two cuts on four rounds? Like one cut after second round, one no, cut no, after no, third, no, or just no, one no. cut after second? One after one. second. Okay, gotcha. Mm-hmm. And, then, um, and then the other thing that the PJ needs to do for the respect of the players, uh, if you miss the cut, just put MC. Like, we don't need to be going. <laughs> like, I don't want to go on here and see that someone shot 27 over par. Just put MC after everyone's name that missed the cut. <laughs> Um, just to show do, respect, be a little, like, be a little yeah. respectful for the players that uh, didn't make the cut. All right, oh. Sam, what did you have, Dad? Yeah, I'll keep it short because I know Brody can't hear me. Um, but one, I think his tournament idea where there's a cut after every hole would be electric, and I think that <laughs> a lot of people would tune in for that. Survivor um, golf. And two, what was my second point going to be? Uh, quick um, translation for Brody: I, He thought that your meme would actually. I don't be a know. Great I still idea. think that. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure he did. That's why I said it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just just your translating i, I just, just think it's gonna be i, th- I yeah, think him that... and like the other 12 people can go watch that golf <laughs> uh, count There's, me one of the 12 yeah I, I i guarantee that thousands of people tuned in for that that would be I, 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 sure electric. Would. I think people who don't watch the pro tour on a weekly basis that, would tune in for that for Hashtag sure also are you weekend. out of your mind brody if the pros actually showed up <laughs> for that we would probably, watch are you kidding me that's Not probably on the a best consistent idea basis, that's what i'm saying that's a long you'd, time. you'd watch an entire pro tour like that no where no, ab and gannon, well. AB and gannon <laughs> all of a sudden just get eliminated after three holes <laughs> who's gonna win man random lotta it's been more be more I mean, of a lottery it, system. It the cash cut line, it's definitely like, I, and I know like on this show, we're trained to like everything we talk about is from a consumer, like media perspective, but this is obviously much more of a player thing is like, it definitely it affects them more than anybody. But um, I mean, yeah. You still, when, especially when the cut gets to two, because I know Gary was saying like, if you care about $200 or $400, it's you got the other thing you got to think about Gary is if someone gets cut, they can bounce. And they're not sticking around paying for an extra hotel to just not make any money. And that's why I think the four round events, they should have a cut after the second round because Mm -hmm. there are some people after two rounds, they know they have no shot at making a cut. And if you, if you miss that cut, on a on a Friday, you can go play a sneaky eight tier. Yes. Go recoup yes. some cash. Exactly. Right. For I disc golf, that makes a lot more. I mean, if you you're actually on, looking out for the players, that makes actually a lot more sense. Yeah, you yeah. won't be on hole sixteen of DDO uh, saluting everybody. I would argue a cut yeah. for a four round tournament though. after round comeback, two yeah. would also decrease the people that come to v- spectate in person because a lot True. of people can't come yeah. into the weekend. And so they wouldn't show up at their favorite pro just didn't. I mean, didn't that's definitely it. a factor. I mean, I can, mm-hmm. I, I think in golf, that's a huge thing. Cause like, I remember, I think it was when I went to the Wells Fargo last year, I think there was a couple players. I, I can't remember if Spieth just didn't play that event or if he missed the cut, but like, that's definitely a thing. Like if you were planning on going to the pro tour and you're not sure if I'm going to go or not, if there's a cut on the Friday and you were going for the weekend, like, yeah, maybe your favorite player gets cut, and you're like, it's not worth it anymore. That's 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 definitely a factor. I mean, most good players at this point are making these cuts, but it's getting tighter and tighter. Like there are, there are sneaky players that are jumping into the cut line. Um, but anyways, we'll move on. Uh, we're just harping on everything tonight, but that's also, all right. I still can't see or hear Dustin. Just so I that's okay. I will be your that. eyes and your okay. ears. Um, if also if you leave and rejoin, you may fix it. So okay. feel free, feel free. Um, all right. We're going to go on to our last topic here. Um, G- Sam's going last, so I'll have plenty of time. Gannon Burr turning one. Am I, am I allowed to say dominant for Gannon Burr's performance, by the way, guys? Yes, that was a dominant performance. He had a 10 stroke lead after Why round Why did you three, say yes. dominant for Paige? What was that? <laughs> because, it, yes, the victory was only what? Two or three on paper, two. but she had the hot round in rounds two and three and was in cruise control in round four. She played three really good rounds, but she didn't play the good first round. So I don't, I wouldn't say dominant. Oh, man. 75% mm-hmm. of the tournament, she was, she controlled it. I mean, come on. Yeah, it was, controlled. That's a, that would have been a great it word. It was borderline if dominant. If you would have changed dominant with control, give me borderline dominant. I would've, I would've it only wasn't it. dominant because of it's what it's because Gannon of Gannon. Is. It's because it's Gannon. Gannon. just changed the word to controlled, though, and that's a perfect word to describe. If you how controlling she won and that dominating time. are the same thing, man. It's the same thing. <laughs> Gannon Burr turning one of the most dominant performances in recent time en route to his eight-shot victory in Portland. This is yet another wrench into the ongoing Player of the Year argument as we venture further into the season. Is he now your front runner? And how much do you weigh wins versus? average finish and podiums how is that all being done as you start to calculate this as we i think we're past halfway in the season now uh dustin what do you think 
Well, I mean, obviously, UA wins the most. UA podiums the next. Then average finish, I think, is a, a nice added factor if things are close to kind of use as a differentiating factor if you need to for like a tiebreaker in your mind or something like that. Um, for me, Burr is my front runner at the moment, but I think that AB is very close. Uh, I think we can all agree that there's three MPO players in the running right now for player of the year. That's going to be AB, Ganon Burr, and Calvin Heinberg. I think we're all probably in agreement on that. If you have someone else you want to add, go for it. But AB, he does have three wins and two additional top five finishes and two additional top 10 finishes, but he has three finishes outside the top 10. He's progressively slotting down if you look at his recent three tournaments. So while he has the most wins, he's had the kind of biggest slide downward, I guess you could say, in like most recent events or something like that. Calvin Heinberg and Ganon Burr are both tied at two wins apiece. However, Ganon Burr's two wins are both at Elite Plus events, which are four rounds events rather than three round events. So in theory, you would say those are harder events to win because there's more rounds that you have to play. And so therefore, you would weigh those wins maybe a little bit more than an Elite event, but not as much as a Major. Uh, I think the other big thing going for Ganon Burr is that he has a bunch of additional top five finishes. He also has only placed outside the top 10 a single time, which is a 13th place finish at OTB Open. So he's been incredibly consistent. He's got two wins, only one win shy of AB, but again, at Elite Plus events with more rounds. With Calvin Heinberg, again, he has his two wins as well, just at Elite events. He has some good top five finishes, but he's had a couple of misses this year, which Burr just hasn't had. So I think at the moment, you got, in my opinion, give Burr the front runner position for player of the year. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely super tight right now. Brody, what are your thoughts right now? Yeah, I hope we go towards what a lot of other sports do with, you know, player of the, the year, MVP voting, um, of where it's like an eye test and everyone has their own kind of opinion on who's doing the best. Uh, because if we really wanted to, at the end of the day, if we really wanted to, we could just create some sort of formula of where we give a certain amount of points out to each player at every event and we weight certain tournaments more than others and they get points. And at the end of the year, someone has more points and then we go, oh, that person had the best season. We could do that if we wanted to. But to me, that's lame and boring. And uh, we already do that. So I think for player of the year for, you know, the talking about who we think is playing the best, I think it has to be everyone has a different opinion. And I'm going to look at certain tournaments and I'm going to say these, co these couple people weren't there. So I don't actually value that win as much. Uh, same thing that you do in other sports. If someone got a win over someone and maybe one of their star players was injured, you're going to be like, ah, I'm not going to count that as much as someone else that beat them uh, home and away. That's another thing. Someone that is like a dominant out in the open player going and winning in the woods. That's really impressive. And the other thing I would say is just the eye test, right? Um, I think Dustin mentioned the average finish. Gannon's actually at 5.1 this year. A, a B's at 11 and Calvin's at 10.1, but a B looks more impressive than anyone when he wins and when he's dominating. And I think that should factor into it. Okay. Okay. I mean that fair enough. You're, you're right on in the sense that like, if we wanted a formula even more specifically than there is right now, yes. it could be done. There has to be, you know, as much as people hate the nuance to MVPs, um, there always will be some, um, Gary, what do you think about the uh, player of the year race? Can you imagine what would have happened if Gannon's C2 putt was on this past weekend? I mean, everyone says that Glendevere is the C2 capital of the world, so Gannon was definitely primed for success. He led the field in C1 and C2 in regulation, and his C1X putting was 92%. Um, to me, two things went in my mind. Number one, this was a showcase that Gannon's mental game is as strong as ever right now. And number two, it's proof that he doesn't have to rely on C2 putting to be competitive every weekend. Um, as for the player of the year argument, we need to look at each player in a vacuum and a combination of their wins and their finishing position. Some of these numbers have been mentioned already, but Gannon has two DGPT plus wins, average finish of 5.1, and his worst finish is 13th. Calvin, two wins, average finish of 10.1, worst finish of 34. Barella, three wins, average finish actually of 10.4, worst finish of 44. And not to steal the, the, the thunder for Edwin stats, but I saw a really interesting idea coming from a comment on another video said to look at the aggregate for strokes lost to event leaders. And uh, Barella has lost 81 strokes to event leaders this year, averaging 8.1 per event. Calvin's lost 68 strokes, 7.6 per event. Gannon's only lost 45 strokes, averaging only 4.5 strokes per event to the leaders each and every weekend. Uh, even though he has one less win, I think Gannon has edged out Barella on my player of the year list right now. And if you need a reason, ask yourself this question. Have you had to make an excuse for Anthony Barella this year? Have you had to make an excuse for Calvin this year? 
No excuses are being made for Gannon Burr. Mm. Um, no matter who your player of the year is, we can all agree the rest of the season is going to be electric. I'm super excited for it. That was a powerful statement from Gary right there. Power because I, I was sitting here, I felt it. I made a lot of excuses for AB this year. It's a it is a full time job. Um, Sam, what do you? Who's your front runner right now? What are your thoughts on the player of the year race? Yeah, that was really good from Gary. I think that if you're forcing me to pick a front runner, um, I think it's still going to be AB. I think that three wins versus two just doesn't compute in my head. Um, I I. It's close though. It's very close. And again, it's the middle of the season. There's still so, excuse me, there's still so much golf to be played. Um, and I'm really excited to see what happens through the rest of the season. I think that um, if I had to come up with like a base, a very basic scoring system for player of the year, I know that everybody else has already said that, you know, the eye test or whatever, but if, if my, my numbers brain had to put some numbers to it, I think that a win is going to be worth one point a plus event is going to be worth just a little bit more at 1.05. A major win is worth a point and a half. A world's win is worth point, 1.6. So a little bit more than a normal major. And then you have this other stat, which is your, crazy average finish stat and i think it can only really apply in certain cases which is what gannon's case really kind of is so far for this season and i think you, you weight that a little bit more than a normal win maybe a little bit more than a plus event um but really the average finishing stat only comes into play when you're having a calvin like season from last year right he he averaged a like a 3.8 finishing place last year which is nuts and, and gannon is currently averaging a fifth place that number can keep dropping if he keeps playing well I, I i'm excited to see where the rest of the season goes yeah well the exciting thing is you know i think we are geared up for potentially like the the closest race we've had in a while and we haven't even played three of the majors like there mm -hmm. and that that ultimately is going to be a huge factor whether other players outside of that three win those majors you know we kind of had that with isaac robinson taking two majors last year throwing his name in the hat or if those players um are winning them. That's going to be huge, huge bumps to their resumes. Um, all right. Well, here we are. We have a tie right now, Brody and Dustin tied and um, we got to break the tie. So mm -hmm. we're going to do something I've been wanting to do for a long time. And that is a disc golf spell off. Ooh, are Jesus you, Christ. are you prepared? Are you prepared? My worst no. nightmare. Thank goodness. I'm not a part I'm of this. Not even remotely. I think you should just push us both through the fact that no one brought up pretzel <laughs> as a player of the year. And the only major winner of this year is a dis, uh, disgrace. I might disqualify you for just saying that. Um, <laughs> cool. are, are you ready for your word, Brody? It's a, I'm going to give you a disc golfer's last name. That's how we're doing this. Yeah. You ready? Okay. I'm your, a terrible speller. You're the best today. Uh, no, your your last name is Heinenen. <laughs> Let's hear your best. There's, there's, a, there's a bunch of E's and I's. <laughs> you can do uh, this. There's no shame. This is a tough last name. <laughs> this is this is a tough one. Yeah. You got to do like the right out on your hand thing. I don't think there's any A's in it. <laughs> Meanwhile, Dustin's reviewing every European. Yeah, I can see Dustin. <laughs> <having> <laughs> I think Dustin's cheating over there. That's fine. I'm not surprised. I'm gonna uh, get. I'm gonna H. Get, okay. Nailed it. <laughs> it's be electric. Is it like H I E N E E N E? No. And. <laughs> I, I will. I mean, you had a, some trains of thoughts. That is there were a G there. in there? Is no, there a G no. All right. Just stop while you're at. Stop while you're at. The correct spelling of Heinen is H E I N. So you just had those mixed up. And then A N E N. Oh, there is an A in there. Yeah. It's oh, spelled yeah. somewhat. It kind of makes sense. All right. Well, let's. Uh, you get like uh, maybe one and a half points for that. Dustin, your. Last name. Let me let me make sure. Show I my like... hands that I'm not like googling or or doing. Oh, I mean, you already have. You already, already have hasn't pulled up. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, yeah, I, wow. I can know what name he's gonna randomly say. Hundred percent. You got Hit him it. with a Japanese player, Trevor. Your last name is. Mm, I, I'm, Hit him I'm, with I'm, an I'm... FPO player. There's no chance that he threw. Oh, an FPO. good point. Good There's point. There's no chance he threw an FPO players up there he's got all the mpo no you want me to like <laughs> close all my tabs like what do you want me to do i, I mean, mean you're, I, they were saying stuff i was trying oh to here we go here we go i got a good oh. one <laughs> leah sinogeny yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
talking about Leah Tisinageni? I mean, Lisa? her last, definitely her not how she, her last yeah, name her last is Sinageni. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, it's Sinigeni. like T S I H J A N N E or something like that. I mean, a good start just finished rough down the end there. It yeah. was it's T S I N A. What's this, what's this tiebreaker gonna be? Because we're never gonna get this. No, I, I'm gonna give it to Dustin because at least he started his word correctly. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. and he also so didn't have not, a poopy attitude so about it's spelling. Not right wrong, it's not a right or wrong situation. It's just you get to decide. Okay. I think it was. I think it was well, more. Side. No, the, the comments will love that. The comments will love. That. <laughs> we do a spelling test and both people get it wrong, but they you can't. just decide who gets to go. They through. can't. That's hurt no, me, man. We should let Sam give them a question. It's like the man. I did have 13 points and then a point or not randomly you disappeared. Or not. So that happened too. I don't know. It's not, you know, it's not, uh, it's not it's like you can make Mando and you can make Mando. It's okay. Does it really <laughs> matter which one of them makes the finals? Oh! Oh, from left field, can, Brody, can me, we man. team up against him together? Like, can we <laughs> ally him? Like, you, risk? You, you Honestly, it's one a minute. risk game. I would almost rather watch we, Brody and Dustin try to collaborate <laughs> on a point, and then like, like Dustin says the first half, and Brody has to like agree and move on with that. It's, 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 it's 30, 30, 30, 30. I was gonna say, pick is this question about up. Ultimate Frisbee too? No, it it's about is. FPO uh, athletes. Dustin, I'll, I'll give you the option. Do you want Brody on your team? No, just go ahead. Dustin. I don't know how that would work. So, go okay, ahead. fine. Just fair enough. <laughs> All right, Dustin D. Gary. God dang what, it. Whatever. Whatever. Um, we'll do this. <sighs> We're doing this behind B again. I don't care what anybody says. Uh, that was right. electric. Final oh, topic. Wow. I've been wait, I've been thinking about dropping that on for so long. Is that long. why you dropped me to twelve points from thirteen? Don't no, lie I, me. I just that was latency. I just I was gonna oh, okay. give you twelve. Okay. Yeah, okay. I was gonna. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That all was right. just latency. That's okay. Latency. Technical <laughs> glitch. Technical <laughs> glitch. Um. All right. Final topic. Uh, we saw yet another promising player arrive at the highest level of our sport with relatively little experience. Sophia Donicky was the highest PDGA number to ever make an elite series lead card. She came from ultimate and just ever over three after over three years of playing shot a course record at a pro tour event. This isn't the first time we've seen a similar story, especially in the less populated FPO division. Will stories like this happen indefinitely in disc golf because of ultimate Frisbee athletes and the somewhat shallow learning curve of disc golf compared to other sports or eventually will this quick journey to the top be impossible? What are we thinking? Gary, do you want to go first or second? Uh, Dustin is the pinnacle of preparedness, so <laughs> I will definitely let him go first. Okay. Dustin, fire away. All right. So with the, the Sophia thing, I will say at least she showed some hints earlier this year, you know, doing well at LBC against Luke and, and Katrina Allen and Maria Oliva and some other top players. So at least she had like some festering, but you still couldn't expect what she did at the Portland Open, which was fantastic. Um, I do think stories like this can happen for now as more women with big athletic backgrounds enter the sport. And what I mean by that is, is whether this be an alternate background, whether it be softball, whether it be volleyball, you name it. Once you get to a high, either high school level or collegiate level, and you have no further that you can go, either because you don't have a professional sport for your sport, like what happens for some collegiate athletes, or you just quite weren't quite good enough to be a collegiate athlete, but you were still a very high-end high school athlete, you're going to turn to something else if you still have that competitive itch. And this is what is happening a lot of time in the FPO field. You saw this in Holland Hanley and Ella Hans. I think for Holland Hanley, she was a volleyball player. Ella Hansen obviously had the ultimate background. You're seeing it right now as Eliezer Middling, excuse me. We also saw Anna Kinstin. I think Brody did an interview with her. She was kind of into some other stuff, but not really disc sports or throwing sports. Uh, Stacey Ronsley, to a smaller degree, is another player who had this exact same thing happen, where I think she had some backgrounds in other athletics as well. And you're starting to see this happen more and more. Uh, the example I have is Taylor Chochik, who is a hepathlete from Oregon. She goes by Diste on YouTube. Uh, she is a top athlete. Uh, she had a recent video with Nathan Sexton where she was throwing like 70 miles per hour and like able to hit like pretty high distances. So when people like this continue to stream into the FPO division, you just wait. Like we're going to get more and more collegiate level athletes or better who are looking for that competitive itch in a different direction because their collegiate careers have come to a close and disc golf becomes their option because they're already interested in it. Now, I do think that at some point in time, though I don't know when that'll be, that yes, the, the, the FPO field will eventually flow with enough athletes to where it will eventually be become like a disc golf specialty type of sport. But right now we're not there yet. And the evidence is in how every season so far, the last three years, a new name or, or multiple names have popped up with athletic backgrounds that do well. Yeah, certainly, certainly has been a huge narrative for that division every single year. I totally agree with that. Um, Gary, what are your thoughts on, on this kind of effect in the FPO division, especially? 
Uh, first of all, congrats to Dr. Sophia because she does have her PhD in chemistry. I don't know if anyone knows oh, that. But, oh, snap. Um, this is this is only her second Elite Series event ever. Uh, mm -hmm. The first was OTB where she oh. took 14th, and she got to play with Paige at both events. Um, when being interviewed about it, Paige described her as being powerful, poised, and reminds her a lot of a young Valerie Jenkins, which is a Ooh. huge compliment. Um, but the power is not surprising because she actually has a background in rowing as well. And when she was talking about the rowing, she said uh, it was an experience where she learned how to do a singular motion to perfection. Um, so you combine that with like the stress of, of, of the sport, the, the body strength, and her ultimate experience, you know, her natural talent in disc golf makes a lot of sense. And we've talked about this on debate night before natural athletes from different backgrounds are going to have a leg up in the transition to disc golf. Um, because there's a lot of athletic motions that translate really well to disc golf and, um, the mindset of determination and grind translates really well uh, at the same time. And ultimate is a great example. I was talking to my friend Oren this weekend who comes from an ultimate background. And he reminded me that, you know, he had a much easier time getting used to the mid range and, and, and putter power shots than most people because of, of that. He also um, talked about how he had a much better time generating power from tough body positions, which can be proven if you look at Sophia because she led the field in scramble rate this weekend. Um, so using that power in, in different kind of body positions. But long term, I think that we're going to see more people come into the sport and have success in this same way uh, for singular events or stretches. But for longer careers, I don't think we can be sure of that yet because something that separates a lot of athletes from established pros is touch and experience. You know, disc golf is very mentally taxing, but it's much slower than other sports because you aren't dealing with quick, fast-paced decisions that have to be made. You have long, drawn-out decisions that can be mentally crippling as you walk from the tee pad to your lie. You know, so essentially what I'm saying is – I. I think that being an athlete breaks you into the sport, but I think being an adapter is what keeps you in the sport longer. And as the sport changes, maybe this happens less, but it's going to keep happening for now. That's a good point because, you know, we have seen certain athletes getting into the game and then burning out a little bit quicker. I think that the interesting thing with FPO, like MPO right now, you feel like every next up player at this point is probably going to be somebody who has been playing the sport since they were 12, 13, 14 years old and gotten really good. Uh, Ganon Burr is like, you know, the prodigy type model of this player. Whereas in FPO, I feel like there's a, still a chance now and for the next few years that the best player we see could be somebody that started the sport very recently and just has that athletic ba background. it will be very interested to see if and when that effect slowly phases itself out as that division gets more saturated. Because right now, and, and Dustin, you made a really good point. You know, there's a lot of collegiate women's athletes who their careers draw to a close. They still have that competitive drive and there's not a ton of options for them professionally in their sport. Talk about a softball player. You know, you got to really look for something like that. Um, and, you know, unless you're playing at in an international level and disc golf's a great landing spot, you can make a pretty good living. If you're at the top of the FPO division, it's going to be, it'll be interesting to see if, the FBO division actually ends up attracting more high quality elite level athletes than MPO in the, in the short term, just because of that idea um, that there is money to be gotten at the top. The purses are increasing, you know, tour championship, you're going to make the same as the men. So like that, that is definitely an effect um, to, to be looking at, but um, Gary, you did it. I, 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 I sense that somebody has awoken in your, in your room. <laughs> yes. This is my, this is my little man. Oh, look at that. <laughs> yep. Matching blue eyes. Holy I cow. know. I was, man, double double blue eyes? How about double that? I don't know. And the thing is, you could have pulled that out anytime, and I'm probably to give you even more bonus points, and, and you waited till <laughs> yep. you won. So. But yeah, I, I want to thank my manager. Uh, he's my one-year-old. Uh, every week he listens to all of my arguments, and some days he gives me a da-da-da-da. Other days <laughs> I get a da 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 But he's a really harsh critic, and he keeps me on my toes when it comes to this stuff. Wow. That you gotta be somebody that somebody's gotta be motivating Gary over there to get all these dubs. Um, there you have it. There's another episode of debate night. Um, no fan driven topics tonight because didn't have a ton of submissions. So scan that QR code. It's going to pop up on the screen. Uh, click that link in the description. I want topics people. I want to hear what you have to say, what you want us to talk about. Um, submit topics that are going to get Brody tilted and they're directed straight at him. I, those are my favorite ones. Um, really love to see it. So make sure to scan that QR code, submit your topics down below. Other than that, I won't be back next week. I'm going to be on vacation. Guess who you're going to see in the host spot. Big hunt. Silas. Oh, or should we let Brody host one episode? Ooh, that'd be great. <laughs> no, no, that would be very I, interesting. It would be anarchy oh. because I just, oh, I refuse. The... I refuse. Are you scared? No, I just don't want to do it. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, it'll be Hunter then. Go hunt.
Everybody <laughs> tune in for that episode. It'll Connor be fun. Connor might I, be electric too. I don't know if he could handle. No, it. Connor would not want to do it. He would get. I'll, listen, I'll it, guest host one day one if you want me it, to. But it's maybe I'll have Dustin. It's a stressful enough Here job, like deciding to hand out people points, and that's the last thing Connor wants to do is is decide yeah. who wins and loses. He does not want to do it. Um, all right, enough of that. Yeah, I won't see you next week. Hunter, we'll see you next week. Goodbye.